Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Interpreting the Rate of Change of a Function. This is part one. So this is actually a graphical lesson. I'm going to show you various graphs, and we're going to talk about what the rate of change of the function is doing at different points in the graph. And we'll do that with a couple of kind of word problems that are attached to the graph. So there's really not much math here, but there's a whole lot of important understanding. Because as I've mentioned several times, we talk about the rate of change, how steep a line is or a line segment is. What is, how fast is whatever it is you're talking about changing? We mentioned many times that that forms the basis later on of what we learn in calculus. So even though these things seem like a simple thing, really the basis of what we're learning here has far reaching applications. We're going to get to a lot more later on. So it's actually really important. So let's take a look at our first little example. Here we have a graph and we have the months of the year uh, along the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the number of visitors. Now, what we're talking about here is a public library. So that's, that's one thing I want to make sure you understand. This is a library. So you can see in January, and I don't even have any numbers here, okay? So it's kind of a relative, it's kind of a relative indication of traffic in a library. In January, we start out February, and then March are constant, and then April, May, June, and July or over the summer are very low in the library because kids are out of school. August. Uh, so this is June, July, August, a little bit higher. September, there's a peak in uh, traffic to the library, probably because kids are going back to school. And then throughout the school year, the traffic to the library dwindles down to you get to the end of the year. So it's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and then December. All right, now I have several little questions here, but I'm not gonna, sometimes I'll write the answer down and sometimes I won't. I mostly want to just talk. And I want you to make sure you agree with what I'm saying also. So I want you to be thinking about these as well. If I don't write anything down, it doesn't mean it's not important. I just don't want to write gigantic sentences down. We will write some of these answers down as we go. So question number one, between what two months did the largest increase, increase occur? And the largest increase of what? Of the number of visitors to this library. So we see, for instance, between January and February, we had an increase of, uh, again, I don't know the number, but an increase of this many people. And then between February and March, we actually had a flat line, the same number of people throughout that period. And a de decrease, an increase, big decrease, decrease. This is a pretty big increase. This looks to be the biggest increase, the biggest month over month increase in this graph. Between what two months did the largest increase occur? This is June, July, this is August, and then this peak here is September. So between August and September, we had a large jump of people. Again, I don't have a scale here, so we don't have to write numbers down. But we want to say that between, I'll put between August and September. Sorry, that looks like something else, but it's supposed to be August, A-U-G, like this, and September. And the reason probably is because, again, students going back to school, they're starting to study, they're going to the library because of that. That makes sense from the data. All right. Part B, explain the slope of the function during the months September through December. So let's go here. This is June, July, August. This is September. So September is right here. Uh, and then October, November, and then finally we have December at the end of the year. And the question says explain the slope. So if we go up here to this point in September and compare all the way through December, what can you say is uh, true about this slope? Now I'm not asking you to calculate the slope. I'm just asking you in general, what does it look like the slope is doing there? Because the slope is the rate of change of the visitors going to that library. Well, first of all, the uh, slope here is slanted like this. So it's a negative slope because these are positive slopes going up. These are negative slopes. So we can say it's a negative slope. And we also can see that the, the you can hold a, a straight edge to it. You can see it doesn't change. The slope doesn't change at all. So it's a constant slope over those months. And it's also a negative slope. So we can just put constant negative slope. What do these things mean? Uh, the, uh, when I say a constant slope, I mean that, yes, the number of visitors are decreasing each and every month, but the rate of decrease is really the same month over month. So in other words, from September to October, I lose the same number of people. You can see it goes down from here to here. But from October to November, I lose, again, the same amount of people. And then from November to December, again, I lose the same amount of people. So when you look at one month, then the next month, then the next month, I'm losing the same amount each month, so the rate of change is not, is not changing at all. I'm losing a fixed amount of people every single month. And of course, it's negative 
That makes sense because a negative slope means something is decreasing. All right, so see, there's no math here. It's just interpreting what the rate of change is telling you here. So the largest rate of change as far as uh, month over month is from here to here because we gained this many people over a one month period. And then of course here is a constant negative slope there as well. All right, let's take a look at problem number two. So here we have the height in meters of a football as we throw it in the air, and this is the number of seconds that it stays into the air. So you grab a football, you throw it up, it goes up for a ways, and then it comes down. Now this is not a physics class, okay? So I'm not drawing uh, very accurate representations, right? Really when you throw things, the exact shape of the graph of whatever it is you're talking about is gonna obey the laws of physics. Here we're not drawing accurate, accurate graphs, okay? But you can still see that as time goes on, the altitude of this ball goes up, 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 and then it reaches some maximum, and then it begins falling back down, and it goes down, 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 down. Again, in real life, it's not gonna follow a curve like this, because the ball's gonna be slowing down as soon as you release it from your hand. But let's just pretend that this is, you know, reality here, and answer a couple of questions about it. So let's take a look at little question number one. For how many seconds is the ball's height increasing? So here we start at zero, we reach some maximum height here, and all throughout this part of the journey, the altitude or the height is increasing. So we say that uh, from zero seconds all the way to the peak here at five seconds, there's, maybe it's a little bit fuzzy because of the peak of this thing is not exactly right at five, but it's intended to be at five right here. Then the question, how many seconds is the ball height increasing? It's gonna be from, from, I'll put from, zero to five seconds. So for basically the first five seconds of, of flight, the altitude or the height of this ball is increasing. Next question, what is the rate of change of the ball's height between five and seven seconds? Now here we actually have numbers on each graph. When you see somebody or someone or an exam or whatever asking you to find the rate of change, what they're asking you for is the slope. We've connected the slope and the rate of change in over many, many lessons now that that is what we're trying to figure out. So when someone says, what is the rate of change of, of something, what they're asking you is, what is the slope in this region here? All right, now, if you look really carefully, if you hold a straight edge here, you can see that this is not a totally straight line. It kind of, it's kind of bending over at the top and then it's kind of getting more straight kind of toward the bottom there. But that's okay, we can still look at the entire region as if it's a straight line and ask ourselves, how would we find the slope here in that region? Well, the slope is always rise over run, right? So the rise or, or the, this direction here means it goes from a starting position of five to an ending position of zero there. And then, uh, then it happens over, uh, over one second period, over a two second period, right? Because it starts from five and it goes to seven seconds. So you can put your coordinates and all this stuff, but you can basically just look at this and say, all right, we can subtract uh, and say, okay, it goes from zero there and then subtract uh, five meters there. So this is the subtraction of the height here to here. And then if we go that way, we have to go seven minus five as well, seven minus five. So we're doing rise over run. We're subtracting the Y value, which is the altitude, zero and then subtract five. And then we're subtracting the X value, seven minus five. We're subtracting the same direction. And the slope that you get is negative five over two, which is negative five halves. Right now, fractions are great, but sometimes it's nice to put things in decimal. That's a negative 2.5. Now, what are the units here? The units are in what? The rise was in meters. That's what we subtracted. The run was in seconds. So it's meters per second. So when they say, what is the rate of change of the ball's height between five and seven seconds? You say it's negative 2.5 meters per second. And this makes a lot of physical sense to us, right? Meters per second is a is a velocity or a speed. The negative sign just means that the ball is going down and not up. That's what that means. It's going toward the ground, in other words, and it's going at a rate of two and a half meters per second. Now again, this curve is a little bit bendy at the top. It's not a total straight line. So really this is the average speed. Maybe in the beginning when it's just coming down, it's traveling a little slower. And at the end near the ground, it's traveling a little faster because gravity is pulling it down. But over the entire interval, the average speed is based on the two endpoints. Even though it's changing very slightly between the endpoints, we can still say more accurately that the average rate of change or the average velocity is two and a half meters per second. Negative just means that it's falling and it's going towards the ground. All right, let's take a look at problem number three. Here we have a, uh, a wacky uh, graph here. 
This graph represents the temperature at various times of the day. So this is 12 a.m., 12 noon, and 11.59 p.m., about to roll over to 12 a.m. All right, so every little tick mark here on the x-axis represents a two-hour interval. So this is 2 a.m., and then 4 a.m., and then 6 a.m., and then 8 a.m., and then 10 a.m., and then 12 p.m., that's noon, and then again, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m., 8 p.m., 10 p.m., and then again, midnight there. So just keep that in mind. And of course, you can see the temperature is going down initially, and then it's going up in the afternoon, and it's coming back down in the evening. That's what's happening. Now, problem number one, what name a time period during which the temperature was dropping? Now, there are a couple of different spots on this when the temperature is dropping, and I only asked you to name one, but we can definitely see that the temperature is starting from a high and it hits a low here. So it's dropping in this interval. From here all the way to here, it's increasing. This is flat. And then all throughout here, it's decreasing, and then it's flat again here. So this is 2 a.m., 4 a.m. So from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., it's dropping. So 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., it's dropping. And then again from here, this is uh, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and then it ends here, 6, 8, uh, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., 4 p.m., 10, 10 p.m., it's also dropping as well. These areas where the thing is flat, it's not dropping there, so we don't count that. Now it says, if Janice likes to take a walk when the temperature is warm and steady, what is the best time for her to do so? So when we say warm and steady, steady is another way of saying things are not changing, the temperature is not changing. So what you wanna do is find the parts of the graph where the temperature is flat across time. Here is one. And here is one as well. This, of course, is warmer than this, so we're gonna say this is the best block of time from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And the, the better mathematical way to say it is that from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., the slope there, or the rate of change of the temperature, is zero. When we have a flat line, remember I told you the slope is always zero because there is no slope. It's not slanted at all. So the rate of change in those regions is zero. So here is just a, a, a quick little lesson, basically interpreting charts and really trying to pick out parts of the charts where the slope is high and the slope is low and tying that to the rate of change of real physical quantities. Because if you don't do something like this, then you end up graphing lines and but you don't really know like how it could be used in real life. I mean, this is a real life thing. You could measure the temperature here in different little segments and treat them almost as little line segments. And then you can compare the slope, which is the rate of change in different, um, in different regions of time. And you can use that in real life for real you know, applications, whatever it is, if you're studying the weather or whatever. Uh, and this is what we do in calculus also. When we study things like a circle, we just chop it up into little line segments and we start to study how to handle things like that. So we can handle everyday real life situations in math and science by taking a complex shape, treating it as little line segments, which is what we do in calculus, and then we can study complex situations. And all of the things that you've learned about slope of a line apply in those situations. So go over these again, make sure you understand. Follow me on to part two, we'll continue to build your skills.